the gut microbiome. It's gotten a lot of attention lately, for good reason, and I hope to explain some things, give you guys some food for thought, and kind of give you my perspective on what it all means. After that, then I'm going to give you some real practical tips on how to keep the bugs happy and how to have a, a nice, well-balanced, flourishing biome. So, as you guys know, I'm Dr. Will. I'm a chiropractor, a nutritionist. I am a foodie. I love to teach people about health and health creation. And I love practical application. So I hope that I can give you guys some action steps to take to really uh, take care of yourselves. Okay? So, we'll go ahead and get started. The gut microbiome, what the heck is that? Okay? Anybody have any ideas? Marissa, she's excluded. Because she, she, she was with me when I was putting this together. Do you guys have any ideas? I know, but I'm not going to say because that's what I studied. Go ahead. No. Okay. Does it have to deal with your gut bacteria? Yes. Basically, yeah. Yes. We were talking about that. I was yeah. prepping him on the way over. Yeah. Good. Good. So he knows why we. Why is it that we have the kombucha and the scoby and the kefir and the perfect sauerkraut? Perfect. So we have. We. I like to ferment. Okay. So so you're uh, ahead of the curve, I would say, and we're going to actually talk about some of that stuff, and I'm going to get down into the nuts and bolts of why those are great practices. Uh, so you guys are really um, great students, you guys are prepared. The gut microbiome is part of our general microbiome, which is about 10,000, I'm sure they'll discover more, but about 10,000 different species of uh, bacteria that live in us and on us. Okay, so if you can imagine yourself as a donut, you have an outside and then there's a hole going right through the middle. So there's actually um, the area that we think of as being exposed to the outside world, which is our skin, our eyes, our lips, but then also our uh, mouths and our digestive tracts are also exposed to the outside world. And so Anywhere on your body or in your body that you find exposure to the outside world, you will find beneficial bacteria. And they're there to protect us from the bad guys. Okay? So, as I mentioned here, most of them live in your gut, but you have them on your skin, in your eyes, in your nose, in your mouth, uh, our birth canal if you're a female, anything that's coming in contact with the outside world. <coughs> And it's not just bacteria. So we'll get to that. Uh, but one of the takeaways I want you guys to understand from this talk is we're talking about hundreds of trillions of bacteria. And they vastly outnumber our own cells. So when you, when you get into the trillions, it's hard to pinpoint an exact number. But the number that I usually go with, for an average human being, you have about 50 trillion of your own cells. Now that's a lot of cells, but there are estimated to be around 100 trillion bacterial cells just in our guts. Okay? That doesn't count the stuff on our skin and our eyes, etc. Okay? So the gut microbiome, for the average person, weighs between five and seven pounds. It is uh, alive. It's responding to the things that are presented to it. And as we'll show you later on, this is a real integral part of our health. So one thing that I think is interesting, as they start to research, they're realizing that inch by inch in our digestive tracts, you find different species, different strains, different colonies of bacteria. Now when you're talking about something that if you were to spread out surface area wise, our, our gut is about the size of a tennis court. So this is a 
huge, huge uh, area, and each individual inch is showing a little bit different makeup. So really kind of a dynamic, dynamic thing that we're carrying around inside us. So the gut microbiome carries about 99% of our genetic information, okay? So as human beings, we have about 23,000 genes. Um, earthworms have more genes than we do. Mice have more genes than we do. And there are, so there's 23,000 human genes. There's about 3 million genes in the microbiota. So the different bacteria. A huge portion of our genetic information is carried around by these little helpers. So as I mentioned, it's not just bacteria in the microbiome. We have uh, fungi that make up the mycobiome. Uh, we have viruses. Most people think of viruses being exclusively a problem, but we carry viruses around with us all the time. Uh, that's the virome. And then one of the ones that I thought was very interesting is that last one, the archaea. Now, these are survival specialists. They have no nucleus, no organelles, and you find these creatures in hot springs uh, at the bottom of the ocean next to geothermal vents that are above boiling. Um, these guys survive in the harshest environments that we know of, and they thrive. So, a lot of diversity, and uh, you know, varieties is spice of life, right? So, I'm going to teach you guys a new word, and that's the holobiont. So, as they started to discover these things that I'm telling you. They had to come up with some new words because we, we really didn't have any vocabulary to explain what was going on. So the holobiont is basically you as a human being plus all of the critters that live on you and in you and that you're living in a symbiotic relationship with. Um, the way I break it down very simply, us plus them equals us. Okay, so when you're talking about something that outnumbers us at least two to one, um, we start to understand that there's really a very deep connection with these invisible creatures. So, it's great that we have them. Where do we get them? The first place that you're going to get uh, part of your gut flora is when you're in your mother's womb. So I mentioned before that there are, uh, part of our biome is contained in the placenta, in the uterus, in the vaginal canal, and so as we're being brought into the world uh, through natural birth, we're ingesting and we're getting these creatures in our noses, our eyes, our mouths, and that's kind of our first introduction to uh, the microbiome. So that's a, that's a huge one, and this fact here plays into some of the implications of what I'm teaching. Um, not to spoil things, but when I'm working with someone from a nutrition perspective and they are talking about food sensitivities, um, allergies, irritable bowel, things like this, one of my first questions, were you born by cesarean section or were you born by a vaginal birth? Because that small, seemingly small difference is going to make a huge impact on what kind of microbiome you're working with. So we also get uh, exposure to these bugs as children. You know, if you've ever watched babies, they want to put everything in their mouth. They want to put dirt in their mouth, they want to put toys in their mouth, their own fingers. This is that child's uh, innate intelligence producing immunity through exposure to, to different bacteria. So uh, I always tell people you gotta let your kids get dirty, you gotta let them play in the dirt, if they want to eat some that's okay, that's their 
innate intelligence expressing itself. It's really a beautiful thing. So we also get uh, some exposure to these bacteria from our foods. Um, one of the reasons why it's so important to eat organic foods and to get some raw food in your diet because things like leafy green vegetables uh, are going to give you exposure to microbes that live in the soil and in the air. So if everything's pasteurized and nuked and cooked to death, then you're not going to get that same exposure. It's really important. So we also get some of our microbiome from the people around us, which is really an interesting thing to me, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So you might be saying, well, Dr. Will, that's really cool. It's neat to know that we're covered in trillions of little bacteria and we're just swimming in germs all the time. But who cares? Right? Why, why does that matter? Well, I hope to show you that it is one of the most important things regarding our health and our health outcomes. So when I say something like your gut controls everything, I'm not exaggerating. Okay? Every physiological process in our bodies is either directly or indirectly influenced by the bacteria that live in us and on us. Okay, Some of the major factors is they help us get energy from our food. Um, they provide us with important vitamins from food sources that we're not breaking down with stomach acid. Okay, So it's a long journey through the intestines and Inch by inch, those bugs are working to break that food down and to provide us with the nutrition that it contains. They protect us from harmful bacteria. And the way to think about it, very simply put, if you're in a big city, say New York City, and you're driving in your car and you're trying to find a parking place, and all the parking spaces are full, then you just keep driving on through. Okay, so when there is an opportunity to park, then you can jump on in there. So if you think about good bacteria living in our guts, they basically take up all the parking spaces, and so the harmful bacteria just go right on through. Okay? On the flip side, if you have dysbiosis, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if you're overpopulated with pathogenic bacteria, then the good guys don't have any place to park. So it's all about competition. And when we see things like uh, dysbiosis or infections or different situations, um, a lot of people know about candida, which is a yeast that can over overrun things and really causes problems. That's because the good guys were out-muscled, basically. So they protect us from many things. And there's actually some really exciting research that is showing that some of these strains of bacteria have adapted to process and help us remove dry cleaning fluid. Is it possible to have too many probiotics? So that's a great question, and we'll get into that a little bit. But the short answer is if there's too many, they're just going to go right on through. So that becomes a very expensive stool, basically. <laughs> um, so they also stimulate healthy tissue production, and they help our immune system to recognize uh, pathogens and invaders. They are an integral part of our health. So there's five things that are really kind of the key areas that are very well researched. And I've broken them down very simply. Um, they help us with our immune system. There's something called the GALT, which is um, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And a lot of people know that our lymph system is involved in immunity. Many, many, many uh, air lymph channels and lots of lymph tissue in our guts. And so, by influencing the GALT, the microbiome helps us to activate true immunity. They are major players in our neurological function. 
Um, they produce many different neurotransmitters, um, serotonin being one that most people know about. They produce thousands of different chemical substances that are found in our bloodstream. So to get in the bloodstream, it has to go through the gut. And the bacteria are literally creating, packaging, and presenting our bodies with these different chemical substances so that we can use them. They play a big, big part in uh, metabolic syndrome, obesity, type 1 diabetes, and when you have a healthy gut biome, then your metabolism is, is hitting on all cylinders, basically. The one on the bottom is huge. They play a major role in inflammation. So inflammation is the key driver of maybe all disease. I mean, the more we research and understand the mechanisms that create problems and create diseases, inflammation is at the root of many, many, many conditions. So I just have kind of a short list here. Irritable bowel syndrome, uh, IBD, different autoimmune conditions, Alzheimer's, autism. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So when the bugs are happy, we're happy. So I mentioned that they play a big part in our uh, mental function, and that's through the, the manufacture of these different neurotransmitters. Dopamine, uh, GABA, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine. If, if you've done some microbiology or some biochemistry, then you know that acetylcholine is one of the key elements in physiology. It drives so many different processes. And these little critters are manufacturing these for us. So when people talk about having a gut feeling or a gut instinct or, you know, it just didn't sit well with me and so I decided to make a different uh, decision, that's a, a literal experience that's coming from communication between the bacteria that live in our guts and our brains. And a lot of that happens through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve uh, is the longest nerve in the body. It travels from the brain uh, down into the, to the abdomen. And these bacteria are literally talking to our brains uh, through these different neurotransmitters. So when we start to understand the implications of this, then we understand that this knowledge literally changes everything. So I want to talk about dysbiosis because that's something that's going to start coming up. You're going to start hearing about it in the news and it's going to be much more common. Dysbiosis basically is kind of what I referred to earlier where the, the good guys get overrun and the bad guys take over. Okay, so it's an imbalance in your gut bacteria and it provides an opportunity for parasites, yeast, and pathogenic fungi to, to take over and start ruling the roost. Now when I talk about parasites, fungi, yeast, pathogenic bacteria, people tend to get a little nervous and that's understandable. But what's important to understand is we all have all of these at all times. So we all have parasites, we all have some fungi and some yeast. It's just a question of who's ruling the roost. Who's in charge? Who's running the show? Is it the good guys or the bad guys? Okay, so I like to go to roots. I'd love to use uh, a little etymology. In ancient Greek, uh, dysbiosis literally translates to bad living. And it goes back to lifestyle, 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 and, and our environment. What are we exposed to? So then you start getting into the exciting field of epigenetics. That's another talk for another time, but um, I think it's really interesting. Some of the words that we just throw around in, in maybe not in common usage, but definitely in, in medical circles right now, 
this is a this is kind of a buzzword, and it literally boils down to, to lifestyle and environment. So, what can cause us to have dysbiosis? Well, we can have stress. We can have excessive amounts of alcohol. Sugar is huge. It's such a key. Parasites and yeast love sugar. They just feast on it. Uh, a poor diet, an inflammatory diet, food that bacteria don't recognize, stuff that's ultra-processed, and they say, we don't know what to do with this. You know, we can handle dry cleaning fluid, but bleached flour, uh, that might be a little bit touchy. Um, obviously, antibiotics are going to have an effect on this because the antibiotic isn't smart. It doesn't say, okay, well, you're a good guy. I'm going to spare you. You're a bad guy, so I'm going to I'm going to ground you into the earth. It's a it's a shotgun approach, and it kills everything. So, these are some things that people run into to create dysbiosis. So, some effects of dysbiosis. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably heard about leaky gut. That's a big, big topic right now, especially in functional medicine, functional nutrition circles. Leaky gut causes so many problems, and it's been linked back to lots of different autoimmune conditions and chronic diseases. I talked about inflammation. Inflammation in the gut causes inflammation in the brain, causes inflammation in our bodies. And so when we start talking about some of the things that really terrify people, like Alzheimer's, dementia, um, mood disorders, bipolar, schizophrenia, all these different conditions, if you have an inflamed and angry gut, which is, remember, the same surface area as a tennis court. If you have that much tissue that is inflamed and angry, then of course you're going to have problems in other parts of your body. We mentioned that our bacteria help us to process vitamins. So if you're suffering from dysbiosis or you have a, a parasitic infection, then you're not getting the nutrition that you, that you need from your food. Food sensitivities, um, leaky gut plays a big part in that. Food particles passing through, getting in the bloodstream and causing an immune reaction. Um, I mentioned the, the connection with neurotransmitters. So if you have dysbiosis, you might be experiencing some brain fog, uh, poor concentration, lack of memory, autoimmune conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, Crohn's disease, uh, I, I could go on and on. Autoimmune conditions, by and large, start as gut problems. And then you have infections like candida. A lot of people are aware of candida and the things that that species of yeast can do to us. Uh, SIBO, you might see SIBO in, in some literature coming out. It's kind of a new concept, but you know, the the media will catch up, maybe, to, to the things that I'm talking about. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and it can cause some pretty, pretty nasty issues. So, I've gone through a lot of different things already. We've covered a lot of ground. The question is, what does it mean? So if you're a food company, it means that you're going to be spending a lot of money advertising probiotics because the word is getting out that the gut is important. If you're a scientist, then you have a new area to apply for grants. And there is a lot of research coming out, a lot of research being done. I don't know if you guys have read much scientific literature, but at the end of almost every single paper, they finish up by saying, this is what we found, but we really need more research. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a huge opportunity uh, for, for research and researchers in this field. And it's deep. And we're just barely scratching the surface. This is really a new discipline. So if you're a medical doctor, then I would hope 
it would make you pause before you prescribe antibiotics to someone when you start to understand how important these bacteria are to us and what a disaster uh, dysbiosis and some of these other uh, conditions that I mentioned can cause in a person's life. So, what does it really mean? I mean, that's kind of the surface stuff. It's been described as a Copernican shift. So, if you guys remember history, Nicholas Copernicus was the gentleman who decided and proved that the Earth is not the center of the universe and that the Sun is in the middle and we're just orbiting. Okay, so when I say it's a Copernican shift, I want you guys to understand that I believe this is a history altering understanding. And it means that we as human beings, as such intelligent beings, we're not the center of the universe. And there is an unseen and and ignored world that is really the power player. We're just kind of actors in the, in the opera. Okay, so this is huge. So I'll get into a few of the other things that I think that this new understanding brings to light. Germ theory is, is dead. The idea that one germ causes one disease is completely out the window. And even Pasteur, who popularized germ theory, said on his deathbed, the microbe is nothing. The terrain is everything. So it's all about our environment. It's not what you run into as far as pathogens. It's how well you're able to fight that. Because we're in contact with these things constantly. We need to rethink vaccine policy because one germ, one disease is completely out the window. We need to rethink the way that we're using antibiotics. And when you start to wrap your mind around the fact that we're dealing with ancient strains of bacteria that have been passed down from mother to child since the beginning of the human race, and, and you're going to prescribe antibiotics for a viral condition, the generations that follow us have fewer and fewer of these ancient strains of microbes, and we don't know what that's going to do to human health. So we literally have all of human history that we've lived in relative harmony with these beneficial bacteria, and then all of a sudden, penicillin shows up, and we're just bombing everything with antibiotics. So we really, really need to rethink that. Treatment of depression. If serotonin is manufactured by your gut bacteria, then does it really make sense to give someone uh, an SSRI drug, mess with their brain chemistry, and completely ignore what's going on in the gut? Sanitation practices, Purell and hand sanitizer everywhere you look, people just slathering alcohol on themselves with the idea that if they kill the germs that they're going to be healthy somehow, we really need to rethink that. Pasteurization, killing everything that's, that's alive in food and beneficial and providing us with all these benefits, we really need to think about that. Hygiene. I mean, antibacterial soap in our bathroom. What kind of logic would drive you, now that you understand the things that I've been talking about, to use something like antibiotic soap? It's, it's madness. Birthing procedures. So we, we do way too many C-sections in this country. And every time a baby is born by C-section, they're being robbed of their birthright, in my opinion. And the washing of the babies, because the vernix needs to be rubbed in. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
the idea that everything has to be shiny and clean and ready for a beautiful picture on Facebook two minutes after the baby's born is ridiculous. For the idea that, well, you know, you're two days behind, so let's just do a C-section and get this over with. These, these C-section babies are being robbed of their birthright. And I'm not saying that every C-section ever done was unnecessary. But when you look at the real numbers, there is a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, necessary C-sections. And there is a huge percentage of people who just want to get it over with, they want to schedule it, whatever. If you know someone who's pregnant, or if you're pregnant yourself, you, you need to get a midwife. They understand what's going on, they understand the process, they let nature take its course. You need to get a midwife, okay? That's, that's one thing that I will say. So does that mean that a C-section doesn't affect just the generation that was born C-section, but every generation afterwards as well? So on the male side, it's not as vital. Um, you're talking about that that baby's health mm -hmm. and that man's health later in life, basically handicapping that person. But when you're talking about female babies born by C-section, then you start to see the ripple effect of not having these microbes that, that have lived with us and been passed on since the human race has begun. Agricultural practices. And when you start to get into the literature and you start to understand how toxic Roundup is and what Roundup in food does to our gut bacteria, it's really scary. So there's something called BT biotoxin. It's a genetically engineered add-on to a lot of corn and if you go to Home Depot you can buy BT, it's a type of bacteria. You can buy it and you spray it on your plants. The bugs who eat the plant, it messes with their insides and they die. So that's a biotoxin produced by this species of bacteria. So they have done studies that have shown that the gut bacteria with exposure to these GMO foods will start to produce BT biotoxin on their own. They're learning. And so I don't know about you guys, but I don't want a pesticide factory inside me. And anybody who tells you there's no difference or who says, well, it's safe, it's been researched as safe, they've never done a human study with regards to GMO crops. Never. They've never done a long-term safety study. And yet, you always hear, oh, they're safe, they're safe. We can't feed the world without them. Even though organic food fed the world since the beginning of times, we really need to rethink this. Conservation methods. What are we doing to our parks? What are we doing to our public spaces? How are we maintaining the natural order? I mean, when you start to understand what these microbes mean to us, then it literally changes everything. So, I'm a lover of philosophy, and I think it gives you a lens through which to view the world. And based on what I know about the microbiome and our unseen bacterial friends, this is this are my conclusions. Reductionism is dead. So the idea that we can tug on one strand of the spider web without affecting the rest of the strands is nonsense. The idea that you can just poke one little area without disturbing the rest is nonsense. Okay, so reductionism is dead. Long live holism. Long live understanding that we are all interconnected that we're living on this incredible earth where literally the actions and the thoughts of each individual have an effect on everything else. That's holism. That's understanding 
that when you tug on one strand of the spider web, that you shape the whole architecture. Mechanism. Mechanism is, is dead. Okay, mechanism says that it's all a chemical reaction. It can all be watered down to atoms. That there is no such thing as life force or consciousness. It's all just based on chemistry. So maybe if you're dealing with chemistry, you have a partial leg to stand on. But when you start to understand the laws of physics, then you realize that this is not a dead rock hurtling through space. This is a living, breathing community that is part of a vastly complex universe. And we don't have any idea what's going on. No idea. So mechanism is dead. Long live vitalism. Basically the way I explain vitalism, vitalism says there's a life force that's flowing through. It's an unseen, unmeasurable something that makes life possible. So the way I illustrate this, I'm here, I'm speaking to you guys now. If I drop dead right now, all the parts are there. Everything that I have now, I have then. So in a mechanistic worldview, where's the secret sauce? If it's all about the nuts and bolts, then if I drop dead right now, well, all the nuts and bolts are still there. So vitalism says it's not just the nuts and bolts, and that the whole is much, much greater than the sum of the parts. And if I drop dead right now, yes, all the protoplasm's there, but my spirit's gone, my life force is gone, my chi, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, there's something there. Another thing, isolation is a killer. And they're doing a lot of studies with mental health and with chronic disease, and they're starting to show that people who are socially isolated really struggle. To me, now that we understand all the things that I've presented, it makes sense that isolation would be such a brutal thing because we are human beings, we are interconnected with our universe, and we need that cooperation for survival. So it's not dog eat dog, it's not every man for himself, it's us for ourselves and our little bacterial buddies that live with us. So it sounds like even like exchanging each other's um, breath in a space or yeah. hugging each other or you know those kinds of things is all part of um, the influences for the gut bite. Yes. Yes. And, and by the same token, our thoughts and our mental impulses affect the activity of the bacteria. So if mm -hmm. you're in a bad mm -hmm. mood and you're negative, then they pick up on those vibes. And just like a negative person will bring the energy of a room down, negative thoughts and pessimism will bring the energy of your bacteria down. They're listening to you. And not just what you're speaking out loud, they're listening to what you're thinking. And, and that's when you start to realize the repercussions of, of what I'm explaining. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, more. So I don't know if you guys know of Sayer G. He is the curator of Green Med Info. Green Med Info is like WebMD for guys like me. Okay, he compiles research, he synthesizes and distills information for people, and it's all about plants, uh, nutrition, lifestyle. This is the wellness version of WebMD. He's a brilliant guy. And I, I hate to put long quotes on the slide, but I thought that this was really well said. The relatively recent discovery of the microbiome is not only completely redefining what it means to be human, 
to have a body, to live on this earth, but it is overturning belief systems and institutions that have enjoyed global penetrance for centuries. A paradigm shift has occurred so immense in implication that the entire frame of reference of our species' self-definition, as well as how we relate fundamentally to concepts like germs, have been transformed beyond recognition. This shift is underway, and yet despite popular interest in our gut ecology, the true implications remain unacknowledged. So yes, they're trying to sell us probiotics, but no, they're not getting the whole point. And I hope that I have been able to let you guys uh, in on what's going to be a revolution. So I just figured I'd give us a second to kind of wrap our minds around that. Um, these are the kinds of questions that keep me up at night and keep my brain working. Um, it's amazing when you start to think about uh, the connectivity of our universe and how we really depend on these little creatures that we can't even see. Okay, so... Well, it makes me think about, reflective moment, it makes me think about the time I spent in Alaska a good part of 10 years, where the isolationism was something to think about. Yes. The time I spent in an academic environment where where I was training people, literally there were thousands of people on campus at one time that were there for generally up to four months, but they were coming from all over the United States. So this interconnectedness. The fact that we now live on the border influences our, our gut biome. And then our travel does does as well. So just a time in Haiti, and so this makes me reflect on on what I might have been exposed to, but also taking to Haiti in my own mm -hmm. in my own presence. Mm -hmm. Did so, you see any Purell while you were over there? Mm -hmm. Okay, those no. people are all living somehow without hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. So. We've kind of gone over the implications, and I hope that this is some food for thought for you guys. You're going to need to ruminate over this. Um, if you guys would like a copy of the presentation, I'd be happy to email it to you. Um, okay. Just, just let me know. So, how do we keep these guys happy? I've told you why they're so important and what they do for us. How do we keep them happy? Well, let's start with some basics. We need to drink clean pure filtered water or spring water. So they put chlorine in the tap water to kill bacteria. So if you put chlorine in your body, you're killing bacteria. Kill bacteria. <laughs> yes. So this is something that when we start to think about the little things that we do day in and day out, it really makes a big difference. So gotta have a water filter. If you don't want to buy nothing but spring water. He was freaked out for a second. He's like, I'm always drinking. I'm like, no, we have a filter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's like, I drink tap water. Oh, my gosh. You guys are covered. You guys yeah. are ahead of the curve. You have a reverse chlorine. osmosis. Good. So, so no chlorine there. Yeah. Very good. You're covered. Um, <laughs> you got to have a good vegetable load. So nine cups of veggies a day. That's by volume, not by weight. Marissa makes me a salad almost every day for lunch. It's in a container, like a to-go container, that's about five cups. So just in lunch, I'm over halfway there. It's not as hard as it sounds. Uh, Lacto-fermented foods. These are foods that have been preserved by bacteria, and this is the original probiotics. So in all traditional cultures, you find some type of fermented food. And it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident. So the veggies are the prebiotic, that's what feeds the microbiome, and the fermented foods are the probiotic because that's giving us some bugs that are beneficial to us. So
So we got to eat organic food. We got to eat food that has bacteria still present. We want to avoid plastics, antacids, and of course antibiotics. So I'll get to antacids in a minute, but that's uh, a point of confusion that I really want to clear up. So thankfulness, gratitude, prayer, and meditation. Our mental impulses and our mood have an effect on these little guys and what they're doing. So when people get really upset, they get really stressed out, they get butterflies in their stomach, some people get really angry and they have diarrhea, that's not a coincidence. Okay, the bugs are not happy. Because who wants to be around someone who's a crab? I mean really, as people we get this, but they feel the same way. So these are living beings that we're in community with. So this one's really overlooked. But when we start talking about holism, when we start talking about vitalism, we understand that these type of things have a seat at the table. So, what are the influences? Who you live with. So, um, maybe you guys know, maybe you don't. If you have more than one woman living in a house together, their menstrual cycles will synchronize. Your microbiome will synchronize to some degree with the people that you live with. Like you mentioned, things you're touching, things you're breathing, things you're eating, who you live with will affect it. What you eat, I hope I've shown, will really affect it. And also just as important what you think. So I want to talk about this because alkaline is kind of a buzzword, especially in health conversations and I see a lot of stuff about alkaline water and people have this idea that if their entire body is alkaline then there's, they're going to be healthy. Different organ systems require different pH ranges. So your skin, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your digestive tract, your colon, they need to be a little bit acidic. And when you read this chart, and you see these are the bad guys, the pathogens, they thrive in an alkaline environment. So the surfaces of our body that come in contact with the outside world are supposed to be slightly acidic. Because we don't want these guys. These are the bad guys. Down here on the bottom, H. pylori. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about that. It will literally eat a hole in your stomach. Look at the pH where it thrives. Write it neutral. So our stomachs are supposed to be about 2.5. Very, very acidic. I mean, you do not want to come in contact with that. If you're munching on tums all day, then are you acidifying or making more alkaline your stomach environment? And that's going to cause H. pylori to just have a party. I mean, they love, they love antacids. Okay? A few of the other ones, we've got staph, strep, pneumococcus, uh, Clostridium tetani, that's, that's one that people know about with lockjaw, uh, influenza, gonococcus, meningiococcus, this would be meningitis and gonorrhea. When you, and, and maybe this is a little bit too in depth, but when you start to think about the different systems that these pathogens target, then you start to understand that different systems are uh, vulnerable because they're supposed to run at different pH ranges. So our lungs are supposed to be a little bit acidic. They come into contact with all kinds of stuff. If they fall out of range, then you have an opportunity for pneumococcus, pneumonia, bacteria, to really go crazy. Um, the male reproductive tract is somewhat alkaline. And without getting into reproductive physiology too much, the prostate produces alkaline secretions. So something like gonorrhea would love to hang out there. That's where they thrive. So 
when we start to put the pieces together, we understand that there really is a rhyme or reason to what's going on, and it's not just luck. Okay, enough. Not everything's supposed to be alkaline. That's the takeaway. So I want to talk about flavonoids. You know, people talk about eat the rainbow, and the, the darker the fruit, or the more colorful the fruit, the healthier it is. This is why. Because our gut flora love flavonoids. They love them. They feast on them. This is like chili rellenos for them. Uh, some, some easy ways to get that. Buckwheat, berries, tree fruits, grapefruit, lime, lemon, apple, pear, peaches, beans, black beans and kidney beans especially. Uh, colorful vegetables, fresh spices, um, red wine, unpasteurized, natural, preservative-free, uh, organic tea. These are all things that are really going to be good food for our microbiome. So, fermented foods. I'm, I'm sure you guys know. The fermented foods are produced by what kind of fermentation? Like for lactofermentation? Lactofermentation. So, lacto sounds kind of like... Yep. Right? Lactic, lactic acid. So these foods are a little bit acidic. And they're a little bit acidic because they are created by the beneficial bacteria that thrive in a slightly acidic environment. So that's why you get the tang from sauerkraut, that's why you get the acid in vinegar. Um, these are slightly acidic and the good guys just go crazy. They have a party. Raw apple cider vinegar, really good. You don't want to go too crazy, but about a tablespoon a day, maybe a little more, will cover you. Raw sauerkraut, a tablespoon a day, that's, that's not that much. Even if you don't like sauerkraut, that's not very much. Raw yogurt or raw kefir, kombucha, you talked about the SCOBY, that's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. That's a, a micro environment in itself. These guys are all hanging out together, living in peace and loving each other. Kvass is one of my new favorites. I, I saw them selling uh, beet kvass power shots at Whole Foods. They, they're in bottles about this big, maybe four ounces. They were charging $4. Um, I throw some organic beets in water and I make it on a regular basis, it's delicious. So, but lacto-fermented foods are some of the safest foods you can eat because the good guys outmuscle the bad guys. And, and that's really what it boils down to. Lacto-fermented veggies of all kinds, yes? I have a question about yes. raw yogurt because we sometimes get raw milk. Yes. Um, but I know that to make the yogurt, you have to heat it to a certain temperature. Does yes. that kill something? Is it enough to kill it? As if, like, whereas you use, if you use, say, organic pasteurized milk versus raw milk. So, what is, I mean, as far as yogurt, the when, benefits? When you make yogurt, you don't get it very hot. You uh, are keeping it within a range that these little guys survive. So, pasteurization, you blast something and you heat it to the point where everything dies. Yogurt is a much more subtle process, and you do it um, usually in like a double boiler or something where you can really warm it up without getting it too hot. So that you, so yes, they are going to survive. So it's still that. better to do the raw versus the pasteurized for that, because I know that, for example, like say if you do raw organic milk, most organic milk has been ultra-pasteurized. Yes. 
So it's actually not, well, I was told once that it wasn't as good as, say, un regular milk. I mean, so because it was ultra pasteurized. If, so it's if you go to the grocery store to buy milk in the state of Texas, and in most states, it's going to be pasteurized. So, Heavy ultra. Cow share. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, ultra pasteurized is where you heat it to the point where it can sit at room temperature for extended periods. That's like the half and half, mm -hmm. and, and the little things that sit out in the restaurant all day long. Um, that is more extreme, but if you go to the grocery store, then you are getting pasteurized milk. And basically all the good enzymes, all the good bacteria, everything that's good for you about milk is destroyed, and it becomes something that is really not friendly to human beings, or any being, honestly. So, great question. No such thing as raw milk in the grocery store, at least not now. Not in Texas. We'll, we'll get there. I have confidence that we'll get there. Okay, so one little note, if you're deciding that you're gonna get into this, you wanna start slow because you're dealing with a delicate situation and if you just overload yourself and you're very unhealthy, you overload yourself, you're not used to fermented foods, it can be a little much. It's kind so, of like detoxing if you're... Yes. <laughs> you gotta be gentle with yourself. Okay. So, anybody have any questions? I know we covered a lot of things and I hope that this talk will inspire brainstorming for days, maybe weeks, or maybe the rest of your life.